I've got to say, I've never seen a report use language this dramatic. We're diving into the meteorological reports for January 2026 across Eurasia, and honestly, what we found is uh, pretty terrifying. It's not just a bad winter. No, it's what the scientists are actually calling the Great Eurasian Atmospheric Separation. A total breakdown, really. It is. It's a profound structural failure that's basically tearing the continent's weather in two. Right, into these two violently competing regimes. So for this deep dive, we want to get to the why. We need to look at the planetary mechanics behind all this chaos. And what's so fascinating is that it didn't start on the ground. The real catalyst was about 30 kilometers up in the stratosphere. Okay, so way up high. Way up. We're talking about a major sudden stratospheric warming, an SSW event that hit late last year. An SSW. So can we think of that as like a sudden mechanical failure, the atmosphere's natural wall just giving way? That's a perfect way to put it. When the SSW happened, this huge high pressure anomaly, an anti-vortex they call it, formed in the mid-stratosphere. And how high up are we talking? We're talking the 10 hectopascal level, so yeah, 30 kilometers, far above where any jets fly. And this atmospheric punch was so strong, it literally split the polar vortex. Allowing all that Arctic air to just bleed southwards. Exactly. So the failure happens 30 kilometers up, but it absolutely does not stay up there. But what allowed that break to happen so, uh, so easily? There must have been a precondition. There was. If you connect this to the bigger picture, this whole thing was enabled by something called the quasi-biennial oscillation, or QBO. Okay. It was in a strongly negative phase, which means you had easterly winds way up high, and that acted like a mechanical break on the jet stream. Wait, mechanical break, what exactly is it slowing down for our listeners? It's breaking the jet stream's ability to hold its shape. The negative QBO is like, you know, removing a critical stabilizer. It lets that stratospheric failure just cascade all the way down into the troposphere. Which is where all our weather happened. Right. And on top of that, the whole global system was already primed for this because of a weak La Nina state. The oceans were at just the right temperature to make the atmosphere really susceptible to this kind of interference. So that deep structural failure translates into, well, disaster on the ground, a real duality. Hmm. In the Western regime, Northern Europe got hit with a rapid Arctic outbreak. And this isn't just about putting on a heavy coat. We're talking about the sudden chaos of Storm Anna. The impacts were immediate, weren't they? Absolutely. Deep frosts, up to 30 centimeters of snow in the UK Highlands. But the real story was the crippling of travel. Mm -hmm. Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport had, what, over 300 flight cancellations in just the first week of January? Wow, and the contrast when you look east is even starker. It is. The eastern regime is just locked in a severe continental deep freeze. Russia, the Caucasus. But the key here is the high amplitude volatility, especially around the Urals. Okay, what do you mean by volatility? Take Yikid Orenberg. We saw a catastrophic collapse of thermal stability. It swung from 37 degrees Fahrenheit on January 9th down to a brutal minus six just three days later. That's a massive shock to any system. It must put incredible stress on infrastructure. Mm. Why the Caucasus specifically? Why did they face such immediate collapse risk? It's the combination of heavy, wet snow with those sudden temperature drops. Mm. In Armenia, the situation just escalated so fast Heavy snow brought down transmission towers. Oh, wow. Yeah, more than 50 settlements just lost power. And in Georgia, the critical Stepens Mindelaris Highway, a major cargo route, it was paralyzed. Risk of being shut down for five days straight. So what does this all mean long term? The reports keep throwing this phrase around, the new normal. Crippling freezes on one side of a continent, you know, massive instability on the other, happening at the same time. Well, it raises a huge question about agricultural consequences. On the one hand, those sudden temperature drops in the Caucasus are a major stress test for perennial crops. Vineyards, for example, can be totally wiped out. But there's an upside somewhere in this. Surprisingly, yes. Buried in the reports is this idea that the deep Siberian freeze with temperatures down to minus 60 Celsius might provide a kind of natural Siberian disinfection, disinfection by terminating pests like the Siberian silk moth. So, you know, a potential long-term agricultural benefit from a short-term disaster. So the big takeaway from this deep dive is pretty clear. Weather risk management can't just be about tracking cold fronts anymore. Not at all. That's yesterday's model. You have to incorporate these huge planetary scale drivers, the QBO, ENSO. That's what turns a bad winter into a historic continent splitting event. Exactly. Which leaves a pretty provocative thought for you to consider. If this period of intense volatility is linked to Arctic amplification, how quickly does our regional infrastructure 
those power grids in Armenia, the airports in the Netherlands. How quickly does it all have to adapt to these sudden catastrophic couplings between the stratosphere and the weather we feel on the ground? 